you. Thank you, Robin. So um, again, we could have taken each one of the sessions we've had today and just <laughs> reveled in it for another hour or so. Um, so I'm just feeling the bounty of wisdom and possibility there is. So so grateful, Robin. Thank you. And now we're going to move to another uh, modality and Dave Saudi, who has also been part of the kind of emerging work in Calgary around faith and spirituality and climate change um, is going to be um, sharing with us um, what do you pack for hope and um, he is going to be presenting from uh, Zoom Lens. So welcome Dave. So glad you could be with us today. <laughs> Hi, it's it's good to be with you. And I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, Deirdre. Thank you. All right. Um, it's it's kind of wonderful to be at this part of the presentation because I get to reinforce and celebrate um, all the good stuff that we've been hearing. Um, I want to share with you um, some insights, some perspectives from two authors, and then uh, draw on your perspective as, as community. So um, I'm, I'm going to be um, reading a lot of just short statements from, from different authors. Um, and I, I want to use the use your imagination that Robin has started with. Um, uh, Sarah mentioned at the very beginning of our time, uh, leaves falling as blessings from God. And um, many of these statements are going to feel like a whole bunch of leaves. And if, if you get overwhelmed by this pile of leaves, I encourage you to just take one and, and hold it and examine it and, and, uh, and let it speak to you. Um, so <clears throat> for the next few minutes, uh, we will shuffle along through these leaves, and then uh, there will be some. Um, we'll we'll start with with the slides in just a moment, um, and then at at the end, as Sarah said, I want to have you pack for me my knapsack <laughs> as, as as a way of reviewing and and taking some something with something out of the presentations today that, that, will, that we can take with us into the journey in the climate crisis. So yes, let's begin with the first slide, please. Okay, I hope to share uh, these insights uh, on what hope is from two perspectives. The first is a book by Jane Goodall, um, The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times. It's an interesting title, um, because it's, it's addressing our topic, our quest for hope. And these certainly are trying times, and that has come up in some of our, our breakup uh, conversations. Jane's book is really helpful as a perspective in considering hope as an individual. Next slide, please. I want to supplement that with a perspective from Veronis Miles in her book, Embodied Hope, a homiletical theology reflection. She speaks about an embodied hope, obviously. A, um, she speaks about an incarnational perspective in the collective community. So we have an individual perspective and a collective perspective. And then lastly, next slide, please. Um, I will ask you to help me pack what we need for this trip. So we'll begin with perspectives from Jane. Next slide, there we go. Um, what is hope? Well, let's start with what hope is not. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is not passive. It requires action and engagement. Many, she writes, many think that the world is in a mess and they do nothing about it. They feel helpless and hopeless. Without hope, all is lost. But she writes, next slide, Hope is contagious. It brings solace in a time of anguish, direction in a time of uncertainty, and courage in a time of fear. We live in a dire environmental nightmare, 
She acknowledges, we certainly hope it's not too late, but we know this will not change unless we take action. You won't be active unless you hope that your action is going to do some good. You need hope to get you going, but by taking action, you generate hope. It's a circular thing. So where do you start in a circle? Do you need to have the hope in order to get going? Sometimes you need to get going and do something in order to generate that hope, find that hope, reinforce that hope. That's that circular thing. Hope is not an emotion. And, and she makes an interesting distinction between herself as a naturalist and a scientist. A naturalist looks for the wonder in nature. A scientist is more focused on the facts and a desire to quantify it. As a naturalist, you need to have empathy and intuition and love. As a naturalist, you are full of awe and wonder. And I think that some of the uh, reflections we've had today um, have been imaginative and in inviting us into that awe and wonder. Hope is different from wishing or fantasizing, um, but in, involves thinking about the future with rich imagery, both, both to fantasize and to hope are future oriented and with rich imagery, but only hope sparks us to take action toward the hoped for goal. Next slide, please. Good. One more. Um, there are three approaches to the future, she describes. You can fantasize about the future, which is to have that imagery and big dreams, but it's play, it's fun, it's entertainment when we fantasize. You can also dwell on the future, but that usually focuses on the bad stuff, what might happen. Or you can hope, she says, envisioning a future while recognizing the inevitability of the challenges. Hopeful people anticipate setbacks. Remember that line when we're packing my bag. Um, you can have hopes for life and hopes for the world. There are four things that are necessary for lasting hope. You have to have some realistic goals and some pathways to achieve them. There needs to be confidence that we can achieve them and then some support to overcome adversity. We don't do this hopeful stuff alone. Goodall um, has four main reasons for her hope, and each one of these becomes a whole explicated chapter in her book. Four reasons to have hope today um, begins with the amazing human intellect, the resilience of nature, the power of youth, and the indomitable human spirit. What might we take of that into the bag? Now, let's expand on this with Miles' embodied hope. Now, she talks about three faithful responses to crises, complex questions. The first one, the first faithful response to a crisis might be to steer clear of it. Let's not face it. Let's not give it any time or energy. Um, because what really matters is not what we are wrestling with or stumbling through or tripping over. What really matters is the, the eternal salvation from sin and death. And, and what matters is to proclaim the gospel for our individual faith lives. The task is soul salvation. It's not necessary or wise, according to this faith perspective, to delve into socio political or communal concerns because that just is disruptive, not helpful. Um, I, so here I want to I, I want to come back to something that was said um, by Liz that um, rather than than shedding what we are not, this faith perspective would actually be assuming something that we are supposed to be. And so it's this approach is often um, uh, rule oriented. The world is suffering. And we, if we have the right faith, the right perspective, maybe we'll survive. 
And if not, it doesn't matter because we're going somewhere else. A different faithful response, a very different faithful response is to stand apart from society, but not in opposition to it. We seek a balance between social and religious concerns. Christ is in culture, but Christ is not against culture, and we don't want to take sides. We'll just hold this balance. But the risk here is that we don't take any, we don't make any decisions and we don't take any action. We're just nice. <laughs> There's a third faithful response, a very different one. It, <clears throat> and that's to proclaim and live the gospel as an alternative to violence and suffering and oppression. Hope here rests on a biblical discourse. That is to say, we have a common story. And we live into that story as well as proclaim it. Hope rests on lament, raising a voice alongside of or on behalf of others. We grieve, we mourn, we recognize, and we hold our emotions in a safe place respectfully. We're sharing, knowing that something is wrong. Suffering is, is real, but it's not an individual pathology. It is a common perceived experience so we hold it together and then we rest on intercession there is a point in getting in getting involved there's a reason there is another possibility we can pivot becoming involves change so we have discourse a story lament and intercession and then we have to do something Hope rests on taking direct action. It's not enough to say something is wrong. It's not enough to criticize. It's not enough to say this is bad um, as, as sometimes the prophets are misrepresented. It is also important to have a vision of another possibility. There is another way. And with that vision comes commitment and then the resources to affect change and then the possibility of taking direct action with the support of others. And here you see some, some agreement between, between Miles's um, uh, uh, emphasis on the embodied collective hope and what Jane Goodall is saying about, about individual hope. So here we come to, next slide, hope coming in the present body of Christ. So we have, we have, Christ, the cosmic Christ, who became, who, who didn't just make creation, but became part of creation, assumed a place within creation, but then didn't just leave because this Christ is collectively um, embodied now as the body of Christ, the people of God. Christ remains present and active in this embodiment of the collective people and in the continuing unfolding of creation, not just the people embody Christ, but creation embodies Christ as, as life beget, begets life. Life is constantly revealing, restoring, becoming, and, and being fulfilled. So we have the cosmic Christ, the collective Christ, and then the Christ in each of you individually as part of that collective community. Lives are more than just immaterial souls. Matter matters. God is among creation, acting on behalf of creation for the fulfillment of creation, and we're part of it. Okay, shuffling through those leaves now, right? Um, hopefully, hopefully you're not just um, inundated or buried in them, but you can be playfully kicking them around a little bit. I want to pick up some of those leaves, review what Sarah and others have talked about in terms of, of uh, Trinity and the fullness of God, that the activity of God. And it's time in the few minutes we've got left to pack the bag. Um, so I need to turn to you as community, but we're not going to go into small groups again. I'm hoping that, that Kevin can help just monitor the community that's present at the church and Shannon can monitor the, the people in the community here online. We can, we can take the slides off. Um, 
and maybe go back to the larger kind of uh, vision of uh, so that we can see each other. But I, I want you to to gather some stones or gather some leaves. Um, what do what can we take with us as we go into the the work of faithful people, climate crisis, and living hope? Sarah said. She began a journey without a map. I was thinking to start this conversation, one of the things that we need to put in the, in the bag is a map. Some place that, that addresses those goals that we wanna to get to, but has tons of opportunities. I can go to Regina heading in any direction. I can get to Regina, but there will be changes, right? So, so with the possibilities, there needs to be some intention. And it's, it's probably wise to be hiking in the, in the country, in, in, in the wilderness, if people know that at a certain time, and, and, it's, and I, I should be at a certain place, so that there is some acceptance and, and some monitoring and, and the possibility to come looking for me when I get lost because I am a male and I don't ask directions. <laughs> okay, what else? What else would you out of out of what we've said today? Just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Kevin, Kevin will uh, or somebody there at the church will will um, gather your idea. Oh, songs! Alicia says, great, great thing to begin with. What else will we pack in the bag that feeds our hope and, and supports our journey? I think I, I would want... bring, sorry, my indigenous friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, I'd like to be one of your friends too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can bring more than my indigenous friends. <laughs> what else I... would you pack? I'd, uh bring a book called Bridging Poverty and a thermos and a bunch of coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Somebody said poetry. That was captured, but I like it. So I want to get it. <laughs> Sean online here mentioned good theology about our God and goddess needing to be at least as big and vast as the cosmos. Yes, yes. And, and, and not just, not just the cosmos above, but the cosmos within. We have a universe that we're just discovering that is internal too, um, but how wonderful. And let's sing about that as well. More songs, more thought, more elements to traditional liturgy. Water, living water, H2O water. Um, humor. Humor. Good. Humor. I'm, I'm a very practical person, so I'm thinking, what do we need to survive? And I'm thinking about terms like degrowth and Simpli simplicity. Simplicity. Okay. Yeah. When when you mention when you mention um, being very practical, one of the things that I was imagining packing my bag was a good twenty five or forty feet of rope, because I need to hang my food from the tree. So it's still there. <laughs> I need to know that I can hang on to that rope because there's a little kid in me who's like the kid from the daycare, and we need to hang on to that rope so that we don't wander off, right? Um, very practical. What else can we take? Wax matches. Oh. Matches. <laughs> Wax matches light a fire with when we need one very good okay 
and a first aid kit, somebody says. There will be, there will be, uh, we, an, we anticipate, what did, she, what did she say? We anticipate adversity, okay? There will be setbacks and we prepare for that. What else? A couple more. I just heard the both real. What was that, Robin? I said, I just heard fire and it made me think of the quote by K.R. de Chardin that then, uh, help me Liz, the next thing would be love, right? Right. Yeah, okay. that when we discover the power of love, we will, when the, for the second time, have to discover fire. Okay, um, and, and I, love, I love what you said about the fire within, Liz, all right? So part of the journey is I'm going to get tired. I'm going to get discouraged. I need to hear from you. Tell me again the story about the fire in you and, and, the, fi and the source of that fire, okay? So that, that spark will light mine again. A bedroll. This is well, patience with ourselves. Can you take time? Okay. What was the first word you used? Patience. Okay. To learn how to sleep by a tree. <laughs> yes. And why do you say that? Why do I need to learn to do that? Because when you're sleeping with your back against the tree, it begins to heal your body at the same time. Okay. Okay. And in order to sleep, I have to give into it, release. Yep. I would say we need to pack a willingness to be present with the journey. Okay, be Sometimes present we, with the journey. We focus only on the destination. Mm -hmm. And there's an importance of being present in the journey. Okay. Knowledge. Knowledge. Other ways. Okay. Humility. Um, what Robin said about beginner's mind. Okay. Seeds. Someone seeds. in the chat said reenchantment. That Here's phrase. Me. Okay. Helen. Yes, uh, seeds, both real seeds and metaphorical, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Okay. Um, Dave, this is Rich, and my backpack is getting very big and heavy, full of good things. And I'm also aware that we have one more presenter we would like to make space for. Doreen has prepared to speak with us this okay. afternoon. So I just want to give you a bit of a heads up about that. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll end with thanks. And um, we probably will need to have more than one backpack and we'll share. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I just am um, enjoying the diversity of energies and perspectives that are coming to our morning today. And um, it's been, uh, it's also really lovely to welcome Doreen, Doreen Cott, who is a member of Parkdale United Church. And they have been on a very practical journey of taking concerns about our climate and our presence on the earth. And looking at that from the perspective of being a church with an actual building in an actual place and what they could do to um, make their building, help their building to have a smaller footprint. So we're, we're glad to welcome Noreen to share some of the fruits of their work and some wisdom that she can offer to other churches and congregations that might be considering a similar journey. So thank you so much, Doreen. Okay, looks like we're about ready for lunch. <laughs> uh, well, it's been interesting being the last one this morning because my mind has been whirling like everything. My topic was how to create an efficient church building and looking at 
the earth as a sacred trust, but I'm also heavily involved in Cairo supportable housing, uh, the working group, and listening to everyone this morning, uh, and going back to Liz, a little comment, uh, consciousness shifting. And that's what's been happening to me for months now. There is a big connection between the earth and our housing where uh, it connects our indigenous uh, truth and reconciliation things. It, it's all connected. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, and definitely reinforced today by all of the three previous speakers. Uh, so, to explain what happened at our church, I have to say that this change for us was not quick and it was not easy. It was definitely uh, an action that we finally had to take and that uh, Dave mentioned that we had lots of setbacks and it didn't work smoothly and we had to figure out how to get along. So all of the previous speakers really matched what happened to us if you want to translate it. But I'm going to be very practical and begin telling you that our greening history at the church began with Sandy Navarati guiding us through a church renovation. What a mess. We taught Sunday school by setting tents up inside the auditorium and the kids went to Sunday school inside the tents. They thought it was great fun, but it was pretty hectic. <laughs> um, so the result was fluorescent lighting throughout. We got modern doors and windows, improved insulation, especially in the auditorium. We changed the airflow to about 75% of the church area. And shortly after the renovation, pipe insulation was added to several hot water distribution pipes to conserve heat. Now I've started at the end of our renovation for a good reason. I'm gonna go back and tell you the process of getting there, which was interesting. Um, so it was about 2009 that we decided that maybe we should look at solar and you'll all remember that was a pretty expensive proposition, much dialogue about whether we should do it or not. We couldn't afford it. So here's what we look like 13 years later. Do you want me to show a slide or not? Yes, okay. please. So it's easier to picture the church for those of you on line and here. Uh, the first picture was in February 2, 2020 blowing snow off the sanctuary roof <laughs> <laughs> to begin uh, installing 99 new solar panels. And if you can move the next slide up, you'll see putting a big panel <clears throat> up on top of our church <clears throat> was uh, pretty scary. <laughs> And no, that was not our ministry. <laughs> so each panel weighed 41 pounds and it measured 40 by 80. Don't forget, 99 of them had to go up. And that was February. We have the next picture. And they all had to go up that ladder. Finally, the last picture was our sign during the solar panel installation. Nobody need wait to improve the world. Thank you. So to back up just a little bit in 2018, the Faith and Justice Committees identified that there were two possible 
sources of solar panels. Faith in the Common Good, Reverend Christine Boyle, called with a personal call from Faithful Footprints. And I hope I got all these names right because there's so many different titles and everything. We're all greatly confused about who is who. And Energy Efficient Alberta and a contact with Skyfire. So our council formed a committee of Jim Balshaw, an engineer, thank goodness, and Mark LaBelle, who was a doctor who didn't really know anything about solar, except he tried it on his house and it didn't work and he had to do it again. And they were off getting, obtaining quotes. One worry, roof work had to be completed so it was suitable for panel installation. Remember, everybody, remember this dilemma before you start to look at solar panels on your roof. So by 2019, Faithful Footprints had approved a grant of 30,000 for us. And we had signed an agreement with Skyfire to install 99 panels. They're up there right now, producing 39.11 kilowatts each. So we estimated that we could produce about 36,000 and some kilowatts a year. But in fact, we actually have done 44,600 saving about 1,309 trees. So they tell us, we can't figure out how they know how many trees we save, but whatever. Anyway, we got about 100% of our actual use. So um, the big news was that we actually saved 30,000 kilograms of CO2 from entering our planet. So, uh, just, I knew I was going to get asked questions, so I phoned Jim Walshaw last night and I said, is this true that for six months we haven't had an electrical bill? And he said, yes, that is true. Uh, so don't forget, though, that we've had an $80,000 investment to get that far. And that it's changing regularly and you all know what's happening to electricity bills nowadays. So you can go on our Parkdale United Church website any day, look under uh, ministry and you can, it's published there every day and you can find out what's going on if you can understand it. Um, so I'm gonna back up now. What did we do to get there? Because this is a long time. About 2009 to 2011, it's about 13, 12, 13 years ago, um, we formed a green team. We did an environmental inventory that we last updated in 2011. And I discovered last weekend when Project Plowshares was at the church that we need to do it again. But it was lots of fun. We started using and selling fair trade coffee supplies which by the way, the profit of that pays for our Sunday morning coffee. We got rid of all the disposable kitchen supplies. Um, we discouraged the use of bottled water. We went to work in the garden and did greener gardening uh, processes. We went through all the cleaning supplies, gave them away or did something with them and bought all new supplies for the cleaning the church and whatever. And then we realized we had to redraft everything because our renters were coming and didn't know what to do. And we had to spend a lot of time getting it all reorganized. Well, as you have already figured out, we got a lot of negative responses and we got a lot of positive uh, responses and back to what Dave just told us that uh, it doesn't always work well and you've got to do a bit of work to keep it going. 
So uh, in 2010, we went to ATCO and asked for an energy audit. By July, we still didn't know enough and we were still doing lots of research and figuring out how we should go about this. In September, Reverend Lynn Mackey of Alberta and Northwest Conference advised us that Stephen Collette on behalf of the Greening Sacred Spaces was running a practical program developed by Faith and the Common Good to do green audits on churches. And at that time it cost $500, I don't know what he charges now, but it was the best thing we ever did. It was very enlightening, coming from different eyes and information than ours, and included everything from energy and water efficiency, kitchen and washrooms, air quality, and our property. It included documenting our faith community activities, not just what the building looked like, what we did, who our connections were, and all about changing behaviors. Our report arrived with 32 pages of useful information. Much of this was acted on. We continue to review it and assess our greeting programs regularly. And we use this document as a guide. I highly recommend using this. In 2012, Bev DeLong created an eco audit list and the committee determined which actions could be done. And I think Cecile will say, yes, the Tollefson family and the DeLongs have been very, very involved through this process the whole time. So we decided we needed water coolers and, but we later took them out because people said they weren't clean. So we had to change our mind about water coolers. In November of 2012, we put in low flow aerators on all the hand basins to reduce hot and cold water consumption. No detail was too small. We actually discussed switching from paraffin to beeswax candles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yes, we've got beeswax now. In 2013, we assessed getting hair blade, uh, air blade, diesel, uh, I think they were called diesel air blade dryers for our hands, but we couldn't afford them, $1,000, and it just we had, couldn't do it. So by spring of 2013, we did some fundraising for a water source for the main foyer for low flush toilets, reducing water from 13 liters to six liters. And that's a lot of toilets in our church and an overseas water project. They were subsequently paid for by running Sunday night movies on a social justice theme. You never know what you could do. In 2013, we ordered our first dissolved laundry soap and just so you don't in case you don't know what this is I'll show you what the soap looks like comes in packages like this and we sell it and we use it and it has no parabens it's not carcinogenic <clears throat> no phosphates etc cetera, etc cetera. It's made in Moncton, New Brunswick, and they sit, use the money to send kids to school and all sorts of things with this, and we love it. Uh, I always, one of these will do your wash. No bottles, no nothing. So that's what we did. So we explored uh, other ideas. We even decided maybe we shouldn't print so many bulletins and use so much paper. Uh, we went to Skyfire and asked about solar uh, panels on our homes personally. 
And uh, then we went around, checked all the window sills because it's a long time since we had done that renovation. And uh, let's see, what did we do next? Oh, so we put in two water filters, one on the upstairs sink and one on the downstairs sink because we rent a lot at Parkdale United and places like the Foothills Hospital when they came for workshops are bringing in cases of bottled water. So we put the water filters on, that's been the best thing we ever did. So finally by 2016, the report from the Jan Tollefson bequest group arrived recommending that the church proceed with new boilers, solar panels, and the auditorium roof insulation. So according to the last report from our committee, the best thing we ever did was replace those boilers, not the panels, but the boilers. They're 85% efficient and it's reduced our energy bill uh, a lot. So that being done, uh, we started selling shampoo. <laughs> oh, we got, we had lots, we've had all sorts of ideas. There's our shampoo. No, it's not a cookie, it's shampoo. And it's called Unwrapped Life Shampoo. And there's many different kinds. It's not just one. <coughs> and uh, would you believe it? There's no bottle, no plastic bottle. And I got news for you, that'll last you about four months. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do now. And we sell it, I, we really don't make much money because it's, it's expensive, I have to say, but it, it goes over quite well. So there you go, you know our story. Well, we learned a lot in the process, uh, for sure. And uh, it's been very interesting because people who rent and come and use our church now know that we're doing this and ask questions about how we do it so we're able to spread throughout the community uh, the importance of being careful with what you use and, and how you do things. And again, <clears throat> we know the burden of climate change is falling on people in the far north and the global south. We've contributed the most to this problem. And we all need to be reminded that we are called to look after these gifts that God's given us. So it's just time to take action, as Dave says. <clears throat> so. Thank you, Doreen. I think I saw that and I wondered what it was. I was just keeping a snack next to her because she gets hungry. <laughs> but it wasn't a snack, it was soap. It's made in powder too, I appreciate it. We have Wonderful. some folders that I'll stick out, you can pick up. That's great, thank you. Um, Kevin, would it be okay if we, we did it about another 10 minutes? I think so. Would that, would that be all right? I think so. We're going to, if we took through into lunch after, Yeah, my thought is. Um, we don't need to take a long break. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Time. So if, if folk can just give us like another 10 minutes, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create an opportunity for us to do a little bit of kind of um, integration. Oh, just back up. Or here. Okay. A little thank you for being the coach around that. Um, I'd like to give a chance for us to have a little bit of integration about what we've been kind of um, enjoying and receiving today because there's been so much that has been rich and such a diversity um, of offerings and possibilities. So wanted to create time for us to just kind of um, reflect and say, okay, what, where, where, what, has, what, has, what has emerged for me today? Um, huh, so how shall we do that? Um, always a question, of what's the best way? Um, so what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to give us each um, 
10, 30 seconds, okay? To just, I'm gonna trust you that you can be succinct. Um, to just say one gift. Now I know you've received more than one gift, but if you were to identify one gift that you've received today, that you are, you are taking with you, maybe it actually will be the stone that Robin gave us, um, but one gift that you are carrying forward with you. Um, I'd like you to just take a moment to name that in the group. Um, so maybe we'll start here. And um, Shannon, I will call on people here. Um, and then Shannon, you could call on the folk on the screen. So this is an exercise in trust on the facilitator's part, right? I am trusting that you will be able to, to keep it into a, a, a brief because we want to respect people's time and the fact that we have lunch and more work to do this afternoon. But we also want to really honor this time we spent together by giving people a chance to voice what they've received and what has been good. So we'll, we'll do this little adventure together. Thank you. Um, I will call on people, but I will have a challenge because I can't see your names. It's not like on Zoom land where I can see everybody's names. So I will probably need your help in that. I will probably start with the people I know. Uh, so you guys can have a heads up about that and then move to the people I don't know. So um, yeah, so maybe I'll go to Helen first and then, and then Robin and then Elise. If you could just share one gift, Helen, and my gift, one of my gifts is to see you here today. Nice to see you. Uh, maybe because it's the last piece we've just heard, but I love the practicality of your thought. The reading of it. Um, for a Friday church. It just seemed to put the meat on the bones for me. And I need that. Because I know about the internal connection piece, the consent of the tribe. But I need to know some of the how to put it into action. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Robin and then Elise and then Kevin. I would have offered the same answer. I really appreciated the practicality of like, you know, to hear a church community that's not doing this work. Um, but I'm gonna add um, was a real gift. Thanks, Kevin, and then Jake. Um, so uh, I'm the network coordinator for Faith and Recovery, so it's very nice to hear the story of one community that has been doing this work for a long time, that's been connected, that's been using the resources that we have, and you know, we're actually seeing the, the, uh, the long-term effects of, of, of the work that, the, that your organization does. So it's nice to hear more stories. Um, well, in my day job, I'm a pastor, and so this rock, as you mentioned, and also the story of Wild Church, um, those are ones that I'm going to pick. Jake, and then Liz? Uh, I'm going to take with me a sense of community. Liz and Anita? I'm with Jake. I, I feel like we're on a journey with Babe's backpack, and we're all there's different gifts and different people, and uh, it's so wonderful to come together for synergy. You tell them, Doreen. Um, I'll say inspiration, uh, just the gift of everybody's contributions and how diverse <laughs> and beautiful. Doreen, and then we'll go over here to the lovely lady in the blue neck piece, but we'll start with her in here. Oh, we? Yes. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I am affirming my connection between indigenous culture, our housing and this earth and putting it all together. It is amazing. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I was really struck by the holy mountain and the whole that there were safe the sites were sacred to the, the First Nations people. It reminded me of 
my ancestors from the British Isles that there were that that kind of there were a lot of sacred sites in paganism and and yeah just that that we we often forgot them or they were covered over by a church or something so having that as part of our connection to nature sacred nature sites go ahead um i think the word for me is reconnection both in terms of people uh, that I was a candidate for ministry from Parkdale nearly 40 <laughs> years ago, and uh, they keep on giving to me <laughs> uh, in terms of inspiration and love. And uh, also reconnecting all the different thoughts that have uh, surfaced here too throughout my life when I was thinking about uh, two years ago how I did this experiment in our United Church in Athabasca, five Sundays of Wiley Church, and uh, how that rested with the people, and uh, sort of reaffirming that again, too. So, reconnection in many different ways. Lovely. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, learned so much today. I think uh, Tony's, um, I would describe it as a liturgy. I'm not sure. Uh, this, I, I, look, the term I'm thinking is his stony liturgy, and maybe he wouldn't use that term, but uh, I think that was a real gift uh, that, that I'll be reflecting on for a while. Um, yeah, this has been amazing. I think the thing that is resonating the most with me is what Robin, I'm also a Robin. Um, <laughs> um, the social isolation being a modern plague, and just when you were talking about wild church, I just wanted to just grab it with everything I had. So thank you for that. Yeah. The one thing that I gathered, and it was a reminder of Master Eckhart and the three things to focus on, holding action and protest activity. Uh, that was much of my life in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, life sustaining and creating new life in finding ways to teach peace rather than war. Uh, taking the lessons from the stories of my ancestors uh, and to recognize truth in, in different ways. And the shifting consciousness and waking up of wisdom. Um, I think I wrote that out as remembering the story of Rip Van Winkle, that after a period of time, the world starts to wake up to what's going on around them, opening to the knowledge and wisdom of the environmental biosphere. That's putting it all together and um, it's a continuous, has to be done, whether we go off into monastic communities and pray for the earth only, or whether we engage in community with each other. Uh, uh, and not be afraid to raise our voices and tell and remind people that air, water, land, and life are the sacred gifts that we've all been given that we need to hold on to and draw people back to those if we want to help encourage them to see that they too might be in the deep sleep. The Rip Van Winkle and the story told there what would happen in 20 years if you woke up was changed. Thank you. I think for me, how it's how the practical is rooted in the spiritual, in the knowing that we are connected to the earth, to God, to all of these parts of ourselves that are bigger than just humanity, that there is the non-human world as well. And that that's really important going forward to Doreen's presentation on Parkdale and, and how you have kind of incorporated that in your building. And I am from the FCJ Center, and we are currently looking at ways that we can do 
something with our old building as well and and see how we can bring that more in line with with what is environmentally friendly but keeping the spirituality within that so i'm very thankful for this morning my little rock reminds me it's like a mini nandaska so now i will look at it as my sacred place I <laughs> right there and also i really learned that hope is not an emo emotion mm -hmm. and hope requires direct action mm -hmm. because often we just hope and think oh i've done my work i just hope it will happen so direct action for sure and i'm going to buy jane goodall's book so shannon i'm not sure do we have time are you going i think so I okay all right, so Shannon, I'll turn it over to you to okay. invite you a brief comment from Focus Online. Oh, all, all, all. Okay, so we had some comments in the chat, and maybe in the interests of time, I will read some of them, and then I will open it up to folks online to add to that. Um, so, uh, Deirdre had said we, the need for consciousness shifting. Uh, shifting action and the idea of a green audit. Jim said we are really early in the process, so consciousness raising in both the church and in the community at large is the first step, visualizing and dreaming. Um, Sean, earth and spirit. Barb, confirmation that we can act. Alicia, community, I'm not alone. Laura, reminder to look to tradition. Magdalena, capacity. Do folks online, if you have something else you wanna add, just unmute yourself at the, this moment and speak out. I was just glad we did spend so much time on the spirituality, on the some of the background of things. If we don't unchain our imaginations and transform our imaginations, we'll keep acting out of the same patterns. So there's something about that transformation of imagination that's really important to all the work that we do. Yes. Thanks, Sean. Anyone else want to add a word here before we go to our lunch break? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Laura, go for it. I just, I too thought that the the embodied experience of, of taking time for spiritual practice was very valuable. Um, we had an event a couple of weeks ago where it was more cerebral and I really appreciated this opportunity. All right, thank you. Before I stood, and before I stood up here, I saw a comment in there from uh, Helena, I believe, Helena, um, about green exodus is one of the things she's going to be bringing this week. Um, I want to thank everyone who was a participant. I think that part of the, the strength of the way we organized this, uh, maybe of an accidental strength, is that all of you are participants. Nobody is, are almost nobody is here just to observe, but we're all here actively creating community together. And so I'm so glad for all of you who've come for the various reasons. Um, for those of us who are on in person here, we are going to now take a quick break to grab some food but we're going to eat together while we hear some of the reports from across the Prairie's North region. And we'll begin with Shannon's report in about, let's say, 10 minutes or so. Um, so that will give you a chance to eat and not feel like you have to try to talk with your mouth full and listen to what's going on. This has been a time to um, reconnect in Calgary. For me, coming from Edmonton, I'm getting to know all of you for really the first time and learn about the good work that's happening down here. And um, and now we get a chance to hear very even briefer stories from around the Prairies North region and hear what's happening there. They've been listening in. Hopefully they're being inspired and um, 
and uh, motivated to do similar kinds of work in their place, in the places where they come from. But we also want to hear stories about what they've already been doing. Uh, for the people who are here in person, I'll just point out there's two signs at the back. One is for our North, Prairie's North newsletter. Um, so just our little coordinating committee, we've been, one of the ways we've been trying to help build community is by making that newsletter. If you get a moment, um, pick it up. There's two editions there, and I think Javit will talk about that later. Also, no pressure, but if you feel like you'd like to make a donation to cover the cost of lunch, that just helps us do other kinds of events too. And so there's a little basket there. Um, of course, no obligation for that. Um, and so for those of you who are online, please take a moment to um, take a comfort rest, um, get up and stretch. It's a long time on screen and um, move around a bit and then come back uh, and Shannon will begin sharing stories. And then some of you online will be also, it'll be your turn and many of us will be listening <laughs> to you. So 10 minutes. Can I also one more thing, Kevin? Oh yes. Um, if folk are interested in being kept in the loop about activities of Wild Church or Green Exodus or some of the contemplative mystic kind of opportunities that Liz will be offering, um, please, if you don't like me, invite yes. people to sign up. So I'll just leave this yellow pad here and we'd love to have your name and email address and we can keep you in the loop about what's coming on in Calgary because this is just the beginning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good reminder, Sarah. And I'll just say, because I know some of you may have other things you need to leave for. So I'll just say this right now. If you'd like to learn more, um, and if you, there's also an, a Prairie's North email address where you will be able to get those updates as well. So you can see that on the back counter. And if you have any questions or want to know about other presenters, contact us at the Kairos Prairie's North at gmail.com and we can definitely connect you back up with anything you've heard and with Sarah's organization. Thanks. Let's take a moment to just be grateful again. I'll um, invite you to take a few breaths in silence and then I'll just close with thanks. Creator, thank you. So uh, the next presenter is going to be um, a different voice from the Kairos Prairies North uh, Coordinating Committee. Uh, Javid is another member with me, a volunteer with me from Edmonton. Um, and we've, you'll see a little write up in the newsletter, but I'll let you about who we are and, and all that. But I'll let you introduce yourself. You have to stand a little forward so that people are at home can see. Cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So, as Kevin said, my name is Javid Summers, and I am one of the foursome. That's the coordinating committee for Kairos Prairies North. I feel like we're new still, but we've actually been doing this for about 18 months. Uh, so we're not really new anymore. Um, but there was a kind of a lapse, I think maybe a significant lapse in terms of a coordinating committee in this region. So we we're mostly starting from scratch. And I think our job, um, Kevin described, I think is animating um, some of the work that, that has been happening, even if there hasn't been a coordinating committee in the Kairos Prairies North region, which uh, by the way is Alberta, Saskatchewan and Northwest Territories. And um, so animating some of that work and then liaising, I think uh, between uh, the different local groups and then between the region and national and so this annual gathering, of course, is a big part of what we do. We did coordinate an annual gathering last year in November uh, that was <laughs> completely virtual. And uh, yeah, happy that we're got some people in a room now and, uh, and doing something hybrid so others can join too. Um, so last year's event, we had um, Stan McKay and Bob Haverluck um, join us uh, for the learning uh, portion of that. And they talked about um, Covenant and treaty and uh, oh, covenant with the earth and treaty and helped us uh, think about that. For those of you that know uh, Stan, um, uh, Cree man, former um, moderator of the United Church and uh, Bob Haverlick is an author and artist whose uh, work uh, is really uh, provocative and challenges us to think about our relationship with creation in new ways. So 
so that was our annual gathering last year. And then uh, kind of coming out of that, uh, Bob had a book called The Court Case of the Creatures that came out, I think early in 2022. And we were able to host a little, uh, I don't know, I think we called it a dessert hour or something online for people to, uh, to hear a little bit from the book and celebrate that. So that so was an event we coordinated in May. And then uh, the other thing we've been doing is, is this newsletter, which, uh, Kevin printed a copy of, and there's a couple back there. And I think um, probably everyone here would be on the mailing list, but if you're not, you could sign up and uh, you'll get that. So we've done two of those so far. And um, I think we've, we as a coordinating committee have con contributed to these newsletters, but really the newsletter is designed to kind of showcase the work that's happening in the region. So um, much of what was talked about today, for example, could be uh, the types of things that we would feature in future newsletters. And I think it's fair to say we're always looking for stories to include. Um, maybe I'll just talk about who we are beyond me and Kevin. So we have two other Saskatoon based uh, members of our group, Amanda Dodge and Sean Sanford Beck. And um, yeah, they're, uh, we're all pictured by the way on this little newsletter. Um, and I think Amanda and Sean are, are with us virtually right now from Saskatoon. Uh, and so, yeah, the four of us are volunteers. We, we meet typically once a month for an hour and uh, do this work together and have a lot of fun. And um, in fact, we have so much fun that I wanted to, um, to invite others to join us. Um, there isn't a tremendous amount of work to do, um, although we could do more if we had more people, um, but it would be lovely to have more join us and whether it's someone here uh, at this annual gathering or perhaps you know someone, um, you know, I have in my mind a young person uh, or young people that, that might be interested in getting involved in some of this, this could be a really cool opportunity to connect with some others and get some experience uh, in this work. So. I'll just put that out there. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you or people you know who might be interested in joining the coordinating committee and make sure this work continues. Uh, at the moment, I think the four of us are pretty committed to this, but you never know what happens and we wouldn't want to, uh, to have uh, this work lost, this momentum lost again, as it was in the last few years. Um, I don't know if there's anything else more generally to say about the coordinating committee. I was going to talk maybe about, about the finances. Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm the treasurer, um, and uh, <laughs> we we I could present a financial statement, but wasn't going to do that. I just briefly talk about the money we manage. So we get a one thousand dollar grant from Kairos National every year uh, to cover some of our sort of basic admin expenses, bank fees, and <laughs> postage and stuff. Uh, and then, of course, to fund an event like this. And uh, we don't do a lot of fundraising. Um, certainly, we would welcome donations, but uh, we're actually the, the regional body is not a charity, so we can't give tax receipts. So um, we don't do a lot of fundraising ourselves. So we just rely mostly on the support from Kairos National. Uh, but we also um, are uh, the bank for the uh, decolonizing group, which I will talk about. A little bit later so that's actually in terms of financial transactions most of the work that uh, that i've been doing as treasurer yeah and i think unless there's any questions i think that's about all i have to say about the coordinating i'm just gonna just to help bring it up on screen um i'm gonna invite amanda and sean to say hi <laughs> Um, take turns, say hi, so people can hear your voices and see your faces, and then that's all. <laughs> Thanks, hey, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> I'm Amanda Dodge, um, she, her pronouns, with Mennonite Central Committee, Saskatchewan. And uh, yeah, Jeb is not kidding. The coordinating committee is a fun group. So if you're interested in being involved, please do join us. And I'm Sean, Sean Sanford Beck, and I'm in Saskatoon, Treaty 6 as well, and uh, through St. Andrews College, uh, rooted there too. So it's a good time we have, uh, but work does get done eventually. Uh, and yeah, good to be with you all today. Real good. Thanks, you too. That's us. That's all right. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Um, and then I'd also like to just ask um, Jake. Um, Jake is a pastor here at Grace Presbyterian, 
and you've been um, very kind to be our host today. So I'd like to, you know, hear from you a little bit about what Grace Presbyterian Baptist. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be with you today. And uh, so um, I'll back up a little bit because I'm a little taller than other <laughs> folks. But um, Grace has a connection to uh, Kairos and the affordable housing project that is happening here in Calgary through Leslie Lee. And Leslie is a part of our engagement and service committee here at Grace. And so I'm glad to um, connect on a deeper level uh, this morning and this afternoon. Um, so Grace has lots of things going on. I'll, I'll share a few. Um, we've been really involved in the work of truth, healing, and reconciliation. Uh, Grace was one of the uh, 10 churches in Calgary that had red paint splattered on its doors uh, in July uh, of 2021. And uh, our reaction to that was a little different than others. We left the paint on our doors to have a time of community conversation around the meaning of that paint and, and what that meant. And it embarked Grace on a journey of uh, truth and reconciliation as well. So um, we worked with Tony and John, uh, Tony's brother, to host a book study uh, on uh, their dad's book, um, These Mountains Are Sacred Places. We've, we've done blanket exercises. Um, we had a, a public service of lament, actually where we invited people to come and lament um, the actions that uh, the church has taken. And we've shared our history. And, um, and so we've, we've been on this journey and it's, it's an ever evolving journey. Um, so actually right before we were gonna have a mural put on our doors uh, that represented truth, healing and reconciliation that incorporated the red paint, someone came and painted over it. So we have this kind of community mural that's happening on our doors. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, it happens at 2 a.m. So um, it's interesting. But um, so that's uh, some of the work we've been doing there. We have, uh, we're a satellite site for the Calgary Food Bank. And uh, we recognize too that for a lot of people, um, you know, when Doreen was talking about uh, laundry detergent and things like that, laundry detergent is one of the most expensive things in the grocery store. And so if you have a limited budget, how do you get laundry detergent? So we actually used uh, eco-friendly containers and gave out um, biodegradable laundry soap to people uh, just to say, um, here's a way that we can be supportive of you. Um, so um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that um, we've tried to do in uh, engaging with the community. Uh, tomorrow night, we have our uh, annual trunk or treat party. So we turn our parking lot into a place where uh, kids from the neighborhood who live in various apartment buildings and things can come and uh, trick or treat. And we have people who have decorated their cars and uh, it's just a great time um, that allows uh, folks here. Um, we have English language learning classes and we call them English language learning for a specific reason. We aren't a program that uh, you know, prepares anyone for a test, but really it's a way for people who um, are new to Canada to come and be a part of a conversation and to break out of the isolation that oftentimes uh, folks who are new feel because they can't speak English uh, it, as well as others. And so this is a place to practice English. So um, it's fun to pop in on those sometimes and hear you know, when you're teaching about a phrase like it's raining cats and dogs to hear, you know, kind of what people think that actually means. And uh, so, and we know that English is a tricky language as well. So it's just a way for people to come together and do a conversation. Um, so uh, those are a few of the things that we have going on. We uh, help support Reset, which is here in Calgary. Uh, and they work with women who are escaping sex trafficking. And so um, we actually provide a house for them that uh, they use, and, and that's uh, uh, an important part of our ministry. Um, we continue, continue to expand uh, looking at um, uh, earth care and uh, how we can do that as a congregation. We aren't quite at the stage that uh, Doreen and Parkdale are at, but uh, we are continuing to work on that. And so... Um, inviting people into earth care as well. And so um, 
that's a bit of the ministry that's happening here at Grace uh, in, in building community, and I'm happy to talk more about it. Uh, I know that, uh, remind me of your name. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. Me? Yeah. Diana. Diana. Diana was saying that she works, uh, worked at Avenue 15, and we are, continue, Avenue 15 is right across the street. They work with um, homeless and highly mobile youth, and uh, so we're continuing to form a partnership with them where we'll use eco friendly containers and hopefully uh, food leftovers to create soups and chilies that can be given out um, to people who stop by the church, but also to uh, for for um, youth at M15. So we're continually trying to figure out um, how Grace's story connects with the community and how uh, the community's story is a part of Grace's story. And so uh, it's exciting work, it's challenging work, but uh, it's, it's what we're involved in. So thanks for being here today and uh, welcome, glad you're here. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jake, and thank you for hosting us today. Your hospitality has uh, been what made this whole event possible. So, um, next up, we want to hear a very quick uh, thing from Doreen and Leslie about a thing called Kairos, a place to call home. And maybe it's known to all the Calgary folks, but share it uh, so that people in Saskatoon and Regina and Edmonton can learn more about <clears throat> a place to call home. Who wants to talk? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Leslie, you'll, you have to interrupt for whatever. <clears throat> we'll just back up. <clears throat> Calgary Cairo Supportable Housing Working Group is known as a place to call home, sort of. That's part of the problem of naming these things. And uh, we work in partnerships with the Calgary Homeless Foundation and CUPS and Home Space. And it used to be have another name, but it's Home Space now. Home Space holds the mortgage for the four buildings that we have. And uh, the four buildings are called Longbow in Bowness, Claire on McClown Trail, and Acadia Place on Heritage Drive, and Bagview over in Life Scarborough United Church. And uh, we work with those four buildings only. And the clients that we have for, for those buildings uh, come from just about everywhere. Lately, we've had a huge uh, intake of Indigenous people, people from jails, from the street, in from the coal, cups everywhere. <clears throat> and last week, we had our first one. There was no bed in Calgary at all, and we got them on Thursday, and uh, there's no shelter available. So I'm sure that's coming down the road. Um, what Cairo Supportable Housing does is support the housing in whatever way we can, and it's pretty variable. Depends on what skill you've got, how much money you've got. Uh, we do all sorts of things like, um, well, I'll just give you a brief list. We work at Logville uh, with bread from Cobbs and Bagview that's delivered to the community. We work with the new Acadia uh, and Bonus uh, Calgary hubs, uh, whatever. Uh, we go for coffee parties. We've done barbecues. We've done birthday parties. The Christmas party's coming up at McDougal United. Uh, I personally, uh, at Parkdale, do what we call Band-Aid. <clears throat> And there is no budget when a person, like, I'll explain. Thursday, they came from the street and they have nothing. In fact, most of the people that come to live in these places have 
nothing. And nothing means nothing. That means a coat under your head, head for a pillow. No dishes, nothing. And there is no budget for that. So unless we churches or Kairos uh, provide for that, there is no money. Uh, this person came on Thursday. We took beds, a table and chairs, bedding, pillows, dishes. Uh, uh, food supply was, was organized, but sometimes if it's on a Friday night and you can't get to the food bank or whatever, they don't even have food. So Cairo affordable housing just fills in, I guess, wherever it's needed. What would you say? You're at Leslie. No, I, I mentioned to during this recent when we were having lunch that uh, a lot of ours um, is donations, and I know um, the church here. I have people here that donate at the church, and I take them all over to Parkdale United, like all the bedding and and mm -hmm. and uh, the women's group here also supports it. So I buy toasters and coffee pots and inexpensive ones, and I take them over. And but I was saying that the materials that are new were sort of. Um, reusing them so it's like upcycling yeah. or recycling and they they really appreciate them so but I must say that Darlene and Ben who helps also they're like a this huge team it's just the two or three of them right and we need help <laughs> <laughs> more than uh for sure uh yeah can you just tell people the scope of your project like how many you said you own some buildings and how many people you're serving Okay, uh, there the four buildings hold about 490 some uh, uh, people. So at any given time, for an example, Acadia Place has about 90 children. Uh, we don't have many statistics about who they are, but I need to tell you that Harvard University has excellent statistics on our four buildings. And that Our people have come from London, England, and Port, Portland, Oregon, and all over the world, actually, to see what we're doing at these four buildings. As bad as it is, people think it's okay. I've talked <laughs> on a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've talked with people from Regina, and they don't have housing first like we do. It's a whole different, whole different ballpark. I know personally from Band-Aid, we had to keep some statistics for cups, how many people we were looking after. And I know we've housed over some 3,000 people at Parkdale. And the beds, we put in about 40 beds a year. And uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church is being magnificent. Uh, they're our best supporters. So we just team it up. Stuff comes from everywhere. All I can say and without everybody's help we just couldn't do it but it's something that uh, the Calgary Homeless Foundation has to look at if they're going to move people into these buildings they better do something to figure out what they're going to use to move them in. I just wanted to mention that one of the fundraisers that the Cairo support come up here so they can see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do one more thing. Uh, just one of the, I'm in the camera now. Yeah, not quite. Anyway, just <laughs> still not in the camera. It yeah, doesn't sorry. really matter. One of the things that um, the group here at Grace has done in a number of groups is we do the coldest night of the year walk every February, towards the end of February. And the fundraising from that walk, it's a national walk, and they raise, uh, I think last year's about $11 million nationally. But anyway, Calgary, the um, the Kairos Portable Housing Group is one, one of the recipients for the walk we do. And uh, all I was going to say was what the money is used for is to help take down the mortgage for one of the buildings in Bank View is the building they're doing it now, which is one of the place to call home. But initially we were doing it for Acadia Place. And what happened was we were paying this down, I mean, quite gradually, mind you, and some um, anonymous person saw what we were doing and they paid the balance of the mortgage on Acadia Place. They were, they never, we don't know who they were, but because it was a church-based thing and we were raising this money, they paid off the, the balance. So then we could go to help raise for um, Acadia Place. No, I mean bank views are after Acadia Place. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. all I was gonna add. So it's support just, the coolest night of the year. So it's just a real hands-on. And I, one last point of view that it's wonderful to meet uh, people and it's, 
phenomenal for truth and reconciliation uh, goals. And the United Church Edge did uh, okay a, a request that I made last year until they ran out of money. So they, they look at us as a truth and reconciliation avenue for their work. Thank you, Doreen. Again, <laughs> your uh, your energy and the, the things you're involved in <laughs> very much a powerhouse. Um, we have five more short little presentations before we'll hear again from Shannon. Um, the next two or three are online, so I think it is Catherine is next, um, and she's from Regina, Kairos, Regina, right? So that would be me filling in for Catherine. Um, I'm Laura Stewart, and um, Catherine had to leave for a couple of hours, but I have her report. Um, so reading Catherine's words. As I prepare to write this report, I marvel at the journey of Kairos Regina over these past few years. From our initial meetings in June and August of 2019, to discern whether to start a Regina group or restart it. Through our startup in September that year and our last in-person meeting in February of 2020, before the pandemic changed everything, we have managed to continue to survive and thrive. Kairos Regina met 11 times from September 2021 until October 2022. During the past year, there were two working groups, the Guaranteed Livable Income, which disbanded at the end of May, and the eco-justice, or formerly climate justice, and both groups also met monthly. Some of the activities in which we were involved this past year include, but are not limited to, a March for Basic Income in October 2021, um, promotion of the For the Love of Creation conversations, to Jane's Walks, led by two of our members, and of course, the work of promoting various letter writing campaigns and petitions. The city of Regina developed a sustainability framework, which was completed this year, and our group participated in feedback towards this framework. We had several guest speakers at our meetings over the course of the year. For example, Peter Gilmer from Regina Anti-Poverty Ministry about their work advocating for justice for the poor in Regina and Saskatchewan. As you've heard, we do not have a Housing First um, program here. Um, Carrie Munven from Citizens for Public Justice and Cameron Esler from the David Suzuki Foundation spoke to mm -hmm. us about the 1.5 degree target for municipal climate action. Uh, Vicki Obedkoff from Saskatoon and Barry Morris from Vancouver from the United Church and Chantelle Moro Fescuk and Sarah Semelav from Integrated Community Ministries, Saskatoon, spoke to us about the United Church Guaranteed Living Income Initiative. Our main event this year was the Creation Care in Our Places of Prayer workshop, October 15th. We were able to offer our 32 participants a theological reflection on creation care, examples and experiences of churches which have done retrofitting, uh, what is involved in a retrofit, um, and some of the resources available to communities looking to do this work, including things like how to get an environmental audit done um, and some of the financial aid that's available. The response to the workshop was very positive, and our hope is to do some follow-up work with this. We expect to very soon have uh, recordings from the workshop available on the Kairos Canada um, YouTube channel, and we'll also have a um, place where you can look up some of the resources that we gathered. So uh, if you're interested in that, look us up on our, our um, Kairos Regina Facebook page and watch for that. In closing, I would like to thank all our members for their commitment and enthusiasm to the work of Kairos in Regina. In particular, I want to thank Dan Beveridge, who has stepped down from the role of convener. His leadership, passion, and knowledge have been inspiring. Thank you, Dan.
respectfully submitted by Catherine Cameron on behalf of Kairos Regina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, thank you, Kairos Regina, for the work that you continue to do. You're one of our more active groups in the Prairies North region. Um, next up, we have Sean is going to give a report for Wendy from Lethbridge, right? Yeah, hey folks. Um, so Wendy was here earlier this morning and uh, she didn't uh, give me a full report to give. She just realized she had to go to another event and some sort of double booked herself as we do. And so she gave me a list of the various things that, that she's involved with. Now it's, it's interesting. One of the things that we've noticed as a, a coordinating committee is that there are several Kairos collectives or Kairos working groups in the in the bigger areas, but we also have a number of what we call micro regions, which are which are areas within within the bigger region where there's just maybe one or two individuals, um, and they don't necessarily and they always tell us this they they don't necessarily meet as a Kairos group, and they say Kairos has been sort of defunct for a while uh, and then they and then they give us these lists of all the things that they're involved with um and it really it made us think this was a, a key reflection for us is that in some ways it doesn't matter whether an individual or even a group is called kairos or not it it matters that the work is being done and we're just grateful that people still self-identify as Kairos involved or Kairos inspired or Kairos supported or even Kairos curious people. So um, Wendy is one of those folks in uh, in Lethbridge and she does a lot of her work through the United Church congregation, which is uh, MacKillop United Church. There's a couple of United Churches in Lethbridge, but um, MacKillop is the one she's involved with and their social action um justice peace and social action committee so they've been she just wanted me to share that they've been heavily involved with um, opposing open pit coal mining on the eastern slopes of the rockies which yeah sounds like a really good idea doesn't it um they've been working hard against that when it when it uh came up i think it was last year uh that that was gonna the government was trying to get that started again uh, they've been involved she's been involved with a number of affirming events and so that's not sort of officially kairos but we can see where the different um social justice webs uh all intersect with each other so affirming work she's been involved with uh conversations around the buffalo treaty now don't mistake the buffalo treaty which is about um the return of the bison into uh free roaming great prophetic herds which will signal the rebirth of turtle island don't mistake that for the sort of silliness that goes on between saskatchewan and alberta governments looking for uh, <laughs> whatever they're up to i won't get into that uh so she's been involved with buffalo treaty stuff uh and also doing some work on crafting land acknowledgements uh and she uh mentioned john snow within that as well that um been learning from from john and also the uh the issue that i think was brought up that laura brought up to around uh guaranteed basic income as another piece so they've been they've been busy doing stuff in lethbridge and like i say it's not always a kairos group but it's kairos identified and, and kairos friendly people and there's there's a lot of them out there so thank you very much Thank you, Sean. Uh, and our next re presentation report will come from, I think it's Bruce. And Bruce is, with, uh, Bruce and um, Cecile are with Keepers of the Water, I think. Are you staying? Keepers of the Water. Yeah, are you able to stay or are you taking off? <laughs> <laughs> He's putting on his jacket. Ah, uh, I see, oh, I see. Water is life. Yeah. So, what does an activist look like? <laughs> <laughs> My mentor gifted me with this t shirt recently. Oh, There's no such thing as a winnable war. Yeah. And so 
when I got sent off by the church after studying to become a doc and a minister between 1997 and 19 and 2001, 2002, um, I got sent to Athabasca. It's on the border of Treaty 8 and Treaty 6. The river defines the boundaries of those treaties. Um, um, the Athabasca River is the only undammed large major river in Alberta. And we're working to keep it on the dam so that the river has the right to flow as it belongs to and should be able to. Um, so long story. In 2020, 19, 2002, 2003, 2004, we imagined what does peace mean in a time of war. The Gulf War was going on. George Walker, or George Henry, which one was <laughs> at war at the time? Um, and I was a, a child of a, a war veteran who was nearly killed in Holland uh, when the Canadians sent canoes for the soldiers to float down the rivers, capture an island by Nijmegen. And um, it was a disastrous story. Um, and he was hit with a rocket propelled grenade. Uh, and so he survived. And I was taught that war is evil. And it's become part of my mantra. And so peace initiative. Then we got into party started reactivating himself as an activist because he got burnt out and had a slap suit sent against him to stop the pulp mill in Athabasca. The pulp mill in Athabasca was the cleanest pulp mill along the river because of this action of these people who were protesting the cruise missiles. And they used to put on bottle drives to pay off the fine that was given to them. And Potentially, they embarrassed the company and they said, No, 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 because if they never had any way that they could ever pay off the court ordered settlement under a slap suit. The Athabasca region is a sacrifice zone. You heard that this morning the sacrifice zones, the Athabasca River north of Athabasca is a sacrifice zone. It's where Laws are different, people, about development, land development. And the current plan that we're fighting strongly against, we want to bring up Peter's a lot of dust. Yeah, like okay. Um, is that they're going to dump savings bonds back into this river. Just like Aunt Polly got to never been fined for dumping the water into the bay of the river in BC, Murray Edwards and his, his clan uh, have never been charged with the, the, the break. So, um, so what we do. We started out as the keepers of the Athabasca. And a few years later, we paid some money and they organized with Clayton Mueller um, 350.org. We had the healing walks along the, the Athabasca River around the circuit by, by the tennis ponds at Suncor and Sincrude. Those were 11 mile or 11 kilometer walks. We went, I think we had five of them in, in six years. Um, we had all the ministers, the heads of the heads of all the churches in Kairos came to Athabasca to have a meeting, to go on a tour. 
Um, I, I was away at the time we were on holidays. They used the Athabasca, that was where they started. Um, so what we have today, so I said about starting Indigenous Climate Action Group, Ariel Garange and that group are Indigenous people talking about climate change and climate action. So we rolled along and in 2006, the First Nations people at Fort Resolution of Fort Good Hope started the Keepers of the Water Movement and they brought and started and issued a proclamation. You can see that on our website. Uh, there's lots of information on our website. But the story, um, many of the people, I'm, I'm now one of the elders that remembers the whole story. And that's my job is to remind them where they've came from, where they're going. They plan to go to COP27. They should be tangling up with Kairos, working together because I don't want to go. And I, <laughs> I'm not going. Um, but we have, we're planning on sending delegates to, to Egypt, but we should be coalescing and talking with other people at the same time. Uh, so that we have Francois Paulette, Francois Paulette case. Uh, Francois is famous around the world. He's from Fort Smith, across the, the line, north of Alberta or Northern Alberta. Francois Paulette, the Paulette case gave the indigenous people some spot the pipelines in the north and started to give rights back to the people. And Francois is probably one of those that will go on our behalf or with us. I'm not sure who's on the list. I've been given thanks to Mr. Politician in Alberta created a war room. <laughs> and uh, these environmental terrorists were causing a big deal of disinformation about what's going on in Alberta. But it was the best fundraising gift we ever had. Because we were proving that we weren't doing anything wrong. And so from a hundred thousand dollar budget within two and a half years, I know there's about seven times that amount of money. Um, so we're, we're growing, we have the resources, and I get to sit back and let the chief accountant, bookkeeper, this group get to manage the projects that we're working on. And you can see them all on online. And Kairos actually helps send our senior elder, Nancy Scanning, to listen to Desmond Tutu, Fort McMurray, Jennifer Henry, and uh, Ed Bianchi were there when Desmond Tutu spoke to the, the truth at Fort McMurray. And, uh, and we have lots of friends in Fort McMurray. And we, the story is out there. And we're gathering those stories. We're videotaping and getting elder stories. And that's part of our education. We put these in. Zoom has been a wonderful tool to help us connect, not have to gather. But boy, can you sure organize with the Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay. awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Bruce, this is our, I've never met you before today, but I have um, one thing you didn't mention that Keepers of the Water partnered with Council of Canadians to put on a three part series at the U of A. And I've attended some of those online and uh, there's still one more to go. And I think those videos are also being recorded and it's specifically about the tar sands tailing ponds. Uh, so if anyone's interested in learning more about those, they will be, I think those will be available too. We have two more presentations. <laughs> Javid, you're up next. Um, and so we're now into not so much Kairos groups, but groups that Kairos sort of works alongside. And this is, Javid, you're going to talk about the decolonization group. 
Yeah, so my gateway into Kairos, I guess I was Kairos curious at one point. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, uh, I joined this decolonization group, which um, I think we settled on the world affiliated with Kairos. I'm not sure. Not everyone in the group was like super keen to be like, yeah, we're Kairos, but we, we are affiliated with Kairos. And uh, most of us are located in Saskatchewan. In fact, I think I'm the only member in Alberta. And here's our sort of official definition. We're a group of settlers committed to dismantling colonialism with the goal of facilitating educational conversations among settlers from primarily Christian faith communities about decolonization and systemic discrimination in order to equip learners for advocacy and action. So we've been around for two years now and uh, we've coordinated, I think, maybe five events in total. In the last year, um, well, that, that uh, annual gathering learning event uh, in November was, was a decolonizing groups uh, event with uh, Stan McKay and Bob Haverlick. And then in May of this year, we did a virtual event uh, with Rose Roberts and Straker Calvez about um, land acknowledgements. And so that was a two day, two evening virtual uh, event that we did um, that was excellent. and. Um, learned about thinking about land acknowledgements and a bit of a fresh way. And then in August, uh, we did a on the land event at Muskeg Lake uh, Cree Nation uh, and Harry um, LaFond and Jermaine LaFond and Elaine and, and Chad Myers were our teachers there. And I think we had about 40 or so people there for uh, most of a Saturday and, uh, and a wonderful time of being on the reserve there and, and learning and um, uh, um, uh, sessions uh, coming out of the book Healing Haunted Histories by Elaine Enns and Chet Myers. Um, so yeah, we're continuing our work. I think at the moment we're, we're trying to think a bit more about how um, we can do more advocacy type of work as opposed to um, in the last few events, it's been a lot of education and, and that's important and that should lead to advocacy, but we wanna think a bit more uh, um, consciously about how we can do advocacy. And one last thing I wanna say is we have a partner with the Treaty Land Sharing Network in Saskatchewan. Um, and I don't know how many people uh, know about the Treaty Land Sharing Network. I um, don't wanna say a whole bunch about them, but they're doing really awesome stuff. And they have a great website and um, definitely would encourage you to, to check them out. Um, and I think there's rumblings of people around Alberta trying to do similar things. And, and I would certainly be excited to see that happen. So um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Javid. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, the last one is not so much a group, but a, an event that's happening actually next Saturday in Edmonton that I'm involved with. So this one is um, kind of a cool event that was Kairos was invited into to help partner um, as as a spawn as a supporter just um, in name. It's a reparations fund, and it's happening. So a, few, a year or so ago, somebody, a donor, an anonymous donor in Edmonton. Um, donated about $100,000 to the King's University um, to be used for projects that would support um, reconciliation and reparations. Mm -hmm. And um, some, some of the, the recipients wisely decided to gather uh, an advisory council of Indigenous people to guide the disbursement of that fund, but also to connect with churches to make sure that we keep replenishing that fund and using it as um, not just a one-time gift, but as an, a kind of seed money for ongoing projects. The calls to action, the 94 calls to action, um, they have specific calls that are, are spoken to the churches. And sometimes we have um, used our voice to help petition the government to take action, meaningful action, and governments have a lot of responsibility in that way. But as Christians, we wanted to also do our part in our own way. And so this is a specifically a church-based fund, not seeking donors um, necessarily outside of churches to sort of do matching funds into this um, uh, fund, matching donations into this fund 
to, um, to build it up so that it can be a sustainable fund that continues to be um, governed and managed and um, used by local Indigenous people to share, to support events and um, at groups that are um, healing, working towards healing in Edmonton region. So that fund, I think it's called, I might be wrong on the pronunciation, but it's called the Pekatanasawin Fund. And um, you will find out more about these either through our Facebook group, the Kairos Prairie North Facebook group, through the e-newsletter that we've uh, been building, and um, or by sending an email to that email address, kairosprairienorth.gmail.com.